You know, uh, Jay. Yes. We're here with Janet. Uh, uh, we're, we're still with Janet. We're still with Janet. <laughs> we love Janet. So we are, uh, this is, we want to do, we wanted to do a two-part episode. And um, we are, we recorded the first episode a bit ago, and we are back again to continue our conversation with Janet. We and couldn't get enough. We really Janet, could. We, we were like, we had so much more to say. She's like our Aunt Jane. And when we, yeah. went, when we went home two weeks ago, all I could think of is Aunt Jane and Janet have got to meet because <laughs> Jane's a cooker too. <laughs> Jay, you remember what Janet said on the last uh, one? Yeah, the Aunt Jane, I'm was? not sure she uses as much bourbon. As, I'll tell as you right now, <laughs> she is not using alcohol in her holiday treats. Although I think every one of us could use alcohol in our holiday treats. That's your listen. Listen, the two of you, I will argue that point because if you take a look at vanilla, right, yes. and you'll see the content of the alcohol. It's like 80% alcohol. <laughs> I knew. So we're like, we should start hitting up the vanilla. <laughs> you know, I think people, that's why people drink the vanilla in their coffee every morning. <laughs> I've already uh, hit the vanilla. <laughs> you know, so just so that, because in case you, your, our listeners are not, um, in case our listeners aren't um, back to back, like just kept playing, because I think you should totally keep playing. Um, <laughs> Uh, the last time on the last episode of Natalie and JJ plays with Janet, um, <laughs> we talked about Janet and Janet talked about her caregiving journey from uh, the standpoint of how she was just really a caregiver as a child. And she grew, she continued that, that, that it was a part of who she is, a part of your identity. And you were always, we're so many things, but caregiver is included in that definition. You would self-define that way. And we talked about um, her caregiving journey with her daughter who has um, different abilities and how she honestly took on an entire school system and won. And, and we all know that when Janet starts to lower her voice, and gets very serious that you have just unleashed the hurricane. <laughs> so I love that. I've, I made a mental note. Janet, I remember that from the last our last conversation. I'm like, ooh, when Janet lowers her voice, <laughs> she's thorough. <laughs> so. And to be and to be honest with you, it comes from um it, it actually is a good parenting technique that mm. parents don't need to scream and yell and everything. What you lower idea. your voice and you talk slower and you can get your point across. So that's true. That's, the, the big that's question Janet, is, is it, does it work with spouses? Oh, yes, ma'am. It does. <laughs> um, <laughs> for today. <laughs> so we want to, we want to go in to kind of further the conversation so that, you know, I know after my, after Jason and I got back from uh, New York and we were kind of reestablishing our new normal after his treatment. So it's kind of similar. And, and it was very hard for us to figure out what our roles were because things weren't the same. So you have milestones or these mile markers in your life that are going to be seasons of change. And we all know that. So as your daughter turns and goes into adulthood, she, you, I know that it was very important for you to, to work with her, teach her to how to self-advocate and for her to make her own decisions and have voice and choice and that you're not, she's not a child anymore. And so how, I want to talk a little bit more about what that was like for you and your intentional decision of like, I'm going to do this and then I actually have to let her. So let's talk about going in and, and how that impacted you and your decision-making and that sort of thing as a caregiver, because you've transitioned into a new phase of your relationship with your daughter as a caregiver and a mom. You, you kind of got to step back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you know, kind of, sort of, in in that, in, in our relationship, looking at that transitioning for her, you know, we were still sharing a home together, and my son had gone to the military. He was in the Marine Corps, so that we had that transition of him leaving the home and, you know, periodically coming back. He had his own family, 
And so we had time to kind of look at it. And it was a slow progression. We we knew where she wanted to be. She wanted to be on her own and be independent. And so we had to think about what are the steps that we need to do to get there. So instead of looking where we were at that moment and where she wanted to be and moving in that direction, we looked at where she wanted to be and moved our way backward to think what had to be put into place for her to be be at that level of independence. And, you know, I still kept hearing it in my in, in the voice in my head. Dr. Gorge was his name when she was, it was on her first birthday. She would never be able to live on her own. She'd never be able to care for herself and she never would accomplish things. So that, that stuck with me. And so that was part of the driving force. She had already graduated from high school with Mm -hmm. the regular high school diploma with supports, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, So then it was time for me to go to college and and finish up what I knew, what my future wanted to be, because I had to think about what my life would be when she had her own measure of independence. But now didn't so, she all enter? Didn't you said she worked when you were going to college? Yes. Sir. Okay. <laughs> she was in, she was in, um, it was a sheltered workshop. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's kind of changed now. Yeah. Uh, and it was helping her learn work skills. Yeah. Um, and to be honest with you, with her level of disability, the physical disability, the, the speech and language impairment, mm-hmm. it made it difficult for her to be in a, a, a regular job. Yeah, yeah. And and she understood that. We knew that. But it was just the way that the communities have been. I, I don't want to say set up, but it's we often don't see adults with physical limitations, physical disabilities being out in the workforce. Yeah you know, full-time job. So um, I put things in place, was able to leave her on her own. But at that same time, that's when I was having um, opportunities to get to know my husband, my last husband. So, uh, and looking at setting things up like a checking account that she could manage, looking at making her pay bills and things like that. So just kind of putting, laying the groundwork. And then at the same time, figuring out still what I wanted to be when I grew up. (laughs) Isn't that interesting? Because it feels like, and I think for a lot of parents, I think this is so normal in the sense of like couples who have children and they are, they, they go through school and this is the empty nesters. Like this is where people are like, holy cow, I have to figure out what I'm going to do the rest of my life because I've been solely focused on my child for so long. And so what do I want to do? And so you had really put your life on pause. And, and this is a normal caregiver thing. We we put our lives on pause. Let me say we don't put our lives on pause. We put our wants and desires maybe on the back burner to ensure that the care of the individual is, is to the forefront to make sure that they get their needs met. I think that's common. And so would you say that you would also probably did that at the same time? I mean, you did sacrifice your job that you loved so that you could have insurance. Well, I, when, when she was, when, when my daughter was younger, my son was younger, I had that, uh, you're referring to the job that I had. And I, I, I had to make a decision about what was the priority there. Yeah. Yeah. And that, but at the same time, looking at how to be able to function and manage, support myself and support my family. Mm -hmm. And at that time, when she was, uh, she had just turned a year, a year old going in, you know, going to into the new year. And I had to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And at the time that um, when I had the opportunity to go back to college, I always knew that I wanted, I, I had two associate degrees and I wanted I wanted a future. I've always valued education. Yeah. So I knew that the bachelor's degree is sort of like a a, a ticket to the movie. You know, it, yeah. it open, opens doors for you. Doesn't keep you there in the movie, but right. it, it it's sort of a comparison to that. And so I, along the way, I had to make a decision about priorities mm. and where I envisioned our lives to be. And 
continue to support her to be the best that she could be. And my son as well. I don't want to leave him out. Mm -hmm. If I could tell you some of the the story that I said to him uh, about going into into the Marine Corps. Um, And so I... I say to to I said to them and said to my say to my son still to this day I was a mean mom, and they they look at it from a different context and I said no I mean what I say and I say what I mean, mm. <laughs> and so that makes me a mean mom. <laughs> um, so I had to think about what priorities needed to be put into place, mm-hmm. and at the same time I was looking at at priorities for me in in college, and then looking at what priorities were important for her to have her independence Mm -hmm. and to be able to live on her own, but to be able to be a productive, is productive the word I want to use? An adult Mm -hmm. with the responsibilities and taking care of things if she wanted to remain independent. You know, Janet, I have a question and it's something that I deal with. It's a personal thing. Mm -hmm. So I always, I always worry. I have guilt. Look at Nellie. She's like, yes, JJ's guilty about everything. But with your daughter and your son, when they saw you, you, you had your priority. You wanted to go back and get that education in the, did they, they want you to do that? Like, did they say, yes, mom, do that. Or were they like, you know, because like I said, I kind of had the guilt, like, oh, I shouldn't do that. And I think Emily's the same way. No, I shouldn't do that because I should be taking better care of mom. Were they cheerleaders for you? Did they want that for you? They wanted you to have that priority? They wanted it for me because I wanted it for myself. Mm. And I think caregivers don't realize that, that actually they're the person they're caring for is like, actually we do, you know, there's so many out there that said, go, you know, we want you to fly. Absolutely. And, and I think the greatest thing, JJ, that a mother could hear from her own children, whether, you know, when they're younger, you know, it it means a great deal. But when they become adults, and they look at you, and they say, Mom, I'm so proud of you. Mm -hmm. You know, we say that to our kids. But when our kids say that to us, it is so gratifying. And it is so rewarding to know that you've done something well. Yeah. And when you when they say that to you, you know you've done something well with them, for them, yeah. and to them. Yeah. To be to be that kind of adult. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that. So I, I know that so you went to school and you mentioned this a little bit ago. You went to school and then you graduate. And then what did your daughter say? It's time to get a job. (laughs) I just wanted to make sure folks knew your daughter had to be just quite something is my answer is because if you are such a wonderful person. I mean, folks, honestly, you just want to be besties with Janet, but you uh, she is an extension of you. And she she, she probably yeah, she probably was. Um, And I taught her. I shouldn't say I taught her. I provided her a model of strength. Yeah. And I provided her with a model of Mm self-empowerment and to have her voice and being an adult with a disability. That's important when they have to advocate for their own care. They have to advocate for their own services in the absence of us, either as parents or their caregivers who, who cared for them. If we have to step away for whatever reason, whether it be momentarily, intermittently, or permanently, they have to be able to have that strength, that that interpersonal uh, power to be able to take care of things. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So, So let me ask you this. You mentioned that your ex, your, your husband, your, uh, your husband. When did you guys, was this a later, this is a later in life marriage. So did you find time for dating while also having the guy look you? Okay, guys, you just missed Janet looking off to the side. She was very mischievous. So I just want to make sure that caregivers out there can hear 
you are allowed to have a life. So you're advocating for your children. Doesn't matter because you're always going to advocate. You advocate for your son too. I mean, you're your mama in that sense. But <clears throat> you're going back and going to school. And then you said, oh, it gave me an opportunity to, you know, kind of get, you know, spend more time with your husband. I need to I, hear I a met, little bit about I that. I met someone, I think that's what Janet said. <laughs> I met someone. Well, we had it. We had an opportunity to interact with each other, mm -hmm. and that was before, um, like internet connections. That was when um, before Hotmail. It was yeah. <laughs> well, it was. <laughs> I, I met my first husband on Hotmail. <laughs> well, to be honest, <laughs> so it was. We were we were sort of at the forefront of of things, but the mm -hmm. more I talked, we actually communicated via messaging and we communicated via email and it was probably six to eight months before I actually was able to talk to him on the phone Wow! and uh, get to know him. He, he recognized something wasn't quite the same uh, in the, in the way I wrote the email. Mm -hmm. And so he said, just, he said, give me your number. I want to call you. Yeah. And it was a, it was that, that, time that I was trying to decide about college and accepting it. And, mm -hmm. and he was very supportive a, yeah. along the way that if you have this opportunity for, for going to college and things will be okay, you know, he, he supported that. Yeah. And I must say, I have to, I'm going to confess Ready. He, was, he was an Englishman and he was actually, when we first interacted with each other, he was in London, England. Oh, oh wow. Ooh, la, la. Ooh, Janet, you're like yes. a romance novel. <laughs> you are a romance novel. I mean, I do I love know. the Scottish ones yeah. back in the 1800s, but we'll get <laughs> yeah. past that. Don't worry. We can do modern day British. You know? <laughs> so that's so interesting. So it's so interesting because it, it's definitely a change in season, it seems like. Your daughter's graduated, your son's launching successfully. And it's like, I'm allowed to have time for me. Did And, and that's totally okay. I don't think you have to wait. I, I, I don't think you would say I waited 18 years to have a life. It, we all make choices, but you're going back to school. You've met someone who's British. <laughs> I love that. That's intrigue. <laughs> and and you and your daughter are living together and you're it's because at that point you're your mother daughter, but you're also roommates and establishing what the expectations are. And, you know, home by, you know, nine kind of feel is kind of going out the door is you're, I know you're promoting your independence. So that's really, that's interesting. Did you experience any, what was that like for you? Was it, did you, did you have any concerns or any guilt or any worries or anything like that? My, my greatest thought process, I, it, it was maybe a concern, but just to make sure that she knew that I wasn't leaving her, that I was exchanging him for her, yeah. that it ha I had to make it work. And for him at, at some point to get to know her and with him being um, all that distance away, you know, I, it, it wasn't something that I was thinking about having a relationship, but it was, it was nice just to have that, have somebody to connect with. Yeah. And I was still, you know, I was an in-home caregiver. We were yeah. together and all of the things that she needed and she, she could do some of her ADLs but like the cooking and the the personal care and everything that was still there. And I still had to balance that out with the responsibilities uh, in college mm -hmm. and then looking at some me time yeah. uh, and the time that I had with him. So it, we had, I still had to figure out that balance yeah. and we probably talked more than a year and a half before he actually came into the States um, he was an antique dealer and he, mm. he would come back and forth periodically. And so those visits became more frequent yeah. and we got to know each other more and more. And he got to know her, she yeah. got to know him and she absolutely loved him in, in sort of like a father figure. 
And um, he respected her. He understood about her limitations and my responsibilities and everything. And at no point was there ever, it's me against him or him against me. So we we made it work because they were both important to me in, in my life, but I was important to myself as well. Hey ladies, I need to interrupt for just a second to share about the sisterhood membership. It's basically a sale every day. And the best part, it's free. Here's the details. We're partnering with our friends at Benefit Hub and other care partners to save you money. With over 200,000 participating companies across the U.S. and abroad, you'll find discounts at your favorite local stores, huge savings on vacations, amazing deals on home, auto, and supplemental insurances, and everything in between. Go to confessionsofareluctantcaregiver.com to sign up and then definitely tell your friends about it. They can join too. Trust me, there's a discount for everyone. And don't forget, it's free. Okay, back to confessing. Yeah. You know, Jay, Amy talked about that in uh, our podcast with Amy Goyer. She talked about, because Janet, she took care of her parents and she did that for many, 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 many years. And she would go back and forth between Arizona and DC and her significant other uh, was in Boston, I believe. And they, they did this for a long time. And so Mm -hmm. they've just now, and she talked about that a little bit about the reason she thought it worked is because he had the same value system. And so I would say, it sounds like you and, and your husband had the same values with, with one exception. Uh (laughs) Is it tea and coffee? It's tea and coffee, isn't it? Is it Nutella? No, it's tea. Oh, uh, well, I, that that was not the exception, but um, proper cup of tea. You never, ever fix a cup of tea with hot water. <laughs> you you use it with boiling water. It oh, has facts. to be boiled. Facts. Got it. Yeah. I did study but the, abroad. But the one, but the one uh, thing that, you know, I wanted more than anything, and maybe it was just me being selfish, uh, his value, and, and I don't know if it's part of the culture, or what he would say to me, no PDAs. And I go, a PDA. Well, that's a device back then. It was the, you know, the the little (laughs) devices. And I'm going, well, what does that mean? And he goes, well, you figure it out. So I spent months trying that along with what, uh, some kind of, a, a, a a cake. Yeah. So I figured out was nothing more than pound cake, but the PDAs (laughs) were public space. Place of affection. affection. And he would not do that. Mm. No, hold on. I think that's, I think I really do think that's, well, part of that's culture. And part of that is, you know, it's upbringing past experiences. And if you don't see it, then you don't think. That's, that's royalty. He must've been part of the He must've been with Prince Charles, you know, he's a little stodgy. I don't don't know. He just, he he had just a wonderful sense of humor, but anyway. (laughs) It is, you know what? It's the decorum of the British Yes, I will say that. I think that is a decorum. So, so isn't that interesting? So you, uh, so then you ultimately got married and, um, and so that just, that changes, I'm assuming that changed a little bit of the dynamic. So that, I mean, cause it's one thing to date, it's one thing to do a long distance dating, which is the best. <laughs> you still have your own time. <laughs> and then, um, and then you, you come and you create a house together. And so did your daughter live with you? So did you all three, you got, I feel like, uh, you know, uh, what was it? Uh, three's company. I love three's company with Tom, uh, with uh, Tom, what was it? John Ritter. So it, how did it, that was, it wasn't quite like that. No. Um, <laughs> when, when he, when he finally did um, ask me to marry him, mm-hmm. uh, he, he was going through the, the re- the turn door, the revolving door at Roanoke uh, Airport, mm-hmm. and so we had some time to figure it out. And when you're, you know, when you're marrying someone that isn't a, a, a citizen of the states, there's mm-hmm. a whole process. Chaos. Mm-hmm. But we, 
in in that whole time of trying to figure all that out and do a, all the process and everything he did come and he did stay in in the home that we were living with together mm -hmm. but we t we talked together with my daughter and said you know, we need a home of our own. You need your own independence. And I'm still wow. moving along that line mm -hmm. of you will remain in this home. And and we had all, my daughter and I, her name is Leanne. Mm -hmm. uh, we had been setting things up. For example, she was on the lease. Uh, she was, uh, we did the financials together. So mm -hmm. I was setting her up for her to be independent yeah. along the wow. way. And then my husband, um, when he was in England, he found a home that was actually in our in our town. And he said, I want us to buy that home. Yeah, and yeah. Um, it, it actually is one of the historic homes in the town that I live. Uh -huh. And that's what his work was back in England. Yeah. Uh, the old homes, he said. Yeah. So um, we worked it all out and we moved into that home and gosh, for lack of a better phrase, and it sort of evokes emotions for me now. We left her behind. Oh. In the in the apartment. But I don't I don't see it now that I left her behind. Mm -hmm. I left her in a place where she, for all those years she had become comfortable. Yeah. She knew how to function. Mm -hmm. Things were already in place. And when we moved the last piece of furniture and I knew that I wouldn't be staying in, in that home with her, you know, that my permanent home, it was like the first day of kindergarten all over again. Oh, you know, when you put your kids on the bus for the first time yes. and you stay at, you know, Oh, you're strong and everything <laughs> will be fine. You're going to have a great time, all that kind of stuff. And then you, you know, the bus drives away and then you just totally break down and ball oh, like a baby. You melt down. And I oh. I melted down, and you know, his Michael, my husband, said she's going to be fine. Yeah. You did everything that you needed to do. She needs to do this for herself. Yeah. Wow. So it's time for her to fly. She's been flying so long. You know, she walked across the graduation stage. You know, she did all that. You made all that. She Absolutely. did. You know. Well, so, and, so, and how hmm. scary, you know, honestly, how scary it is for you as not only as a caregiver, but as her mother, like you guys have been together. How old was she when she, when you moved out? Um, gosh, I have to stop and think that was 2002. She was probably 22, 23. Yeah. yeah. So but you, she had, she had all the supports that I felt that she needed, even yeah. though we knew that she needed more. Yeah. yeah. But I think she was about 20. It was in 2000, 2002. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She was born in 80, 80. So that would have made her 22. Yeah. Getting ready to turn 23. So, yeah. And you, you guys have been together the whole time. And so it's, it is like kind of child going to kindergarten or whether it's college, although I'm pretty sure mom just mom cried when JJ went to college, Janet, I think everybody knows JJ is the favorite. When I went to college, she put my, my stuff in JJ's car. Cause JJ and I both went to Holland's together. She put my stuff in JJ's car and was like, have a good time. She didn't even go with me. JJ unpacked <laughs> me. Like you could totally tell I'm the middle child. She had no tears. And so but the no tears that you saw. Oh, I'm telling you, she still has no tears. No, there was no tears. <laughs> there was no tears. It's like, was like yes, yes. Get your, get your sister, get your sister right to here. school. Get your sister to school. Uh, and, you know, get her checked in. But, okay. And, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just yeah, and honestly, it was better that way. Um, uh, but you know, I will say what a that's a that's like a such a definitive change. Like you went to college, definitive change. You met someone, definitive change. Did you experience any grief? after you moved out or you, after you and your, your husband moved out because <laughs> she stayed. <laughs> yeah. Well, she, I think she was ready. It was sort of like a mixed emotions for her. She was ready for that. Mm -hmm. You know, she saw the house, but we knew that she couldn't function in the house, but she wanted to be on her own. Yeah. You wanted you out. Is that what you're saying, Janet? She was like, get out of here, mom. Go ahead, mom. Go live get a job. Life. Get a get job. job. Get a husband. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So um and and 
in between the time, you know, I'd gotten a job and I was working. That's when I uh, I started with ombudsman work. Mm -hmm. And so there was that transition between that time. But she, I know she was halfway ready for that to happen, but scared at the same time that yeah. she would be in the house alone and what that would mean for her. And, um, you know, no amount of talking to comfort her would, you're going to be fine. Yeah. You know, you'll, you'll have this independence. You'll continue your life the way it is now. We're, I'm still going to be here. And I was still there. I wasn't there every single day, but I was still there. We yeah. talked every day yeah. and, um, you know, I still helped her with a, a, the a doctor's appointments, all the specialty appointments and all the things that she needed. And we did, you know, the, the basic, uh, grocery shopping. I did, I would pick up things for her, but I would make her do her own grocery shopping. So do you yeah. think that you, your relationship at that point, when you moved out, transitioned back to what it's so, I hate the word traditional, uh, a commonly thought of mother daughter relationship. Do you think that you, because she was pushed? I did. That, I, yeah. Cause it sounds like what you're doing is that independence allowed you to take a step back from the caregiver role as the primary and allowed you to be to, uh, more activities of a, of a expected of a parent. Sort of like that game, mother, may I, mm -hmm. you know, where you take a baby step or a big step yeah. or whatever. So initially they were halfway baby steps, mm -hmm. um, some distance from her, but still I wasn't a helicopter mom, but I knew that I needed to kind of watch things a bit more closely to make sure that right. she was successful. And then as time went on and she was more and more independent, she became her own person. Mm. Oh yeah. Separate from me. Mm. And she took on things and she took on her own life. Then I could take bigger baby steps back or more baby steps back. Yeah. Mm. And, um, I'm, I think about her now, the anniversary of her passing and my husband's passing, um, is coming up in a couple of weeks. And I think about how successful she was because had, had she just hung on a few more months, you know, in, in this world, it would have been 12 years. She would have lived independently on her own and successfully on her own. Wow. So I was able to, to kind of step back just a bit. And you're right, Natalie, um, being her mom and being a confidant and being somebody that she knew she could trust and rely on, but to know that she could also be who she wanted to be and needed to be and who she really was yeah. separate from me. Oh, I love that. And vice versa for you. Yeah. You had the opportunity to follow and have permission to do those things. And so, you know, I, I do want to say this, it's, you are such, you were born to serve. You were born to serve. And that is ingrained in your DNA in my, in my mind. You just, you just, you just absorb that. And so not only did she care for everybody um, in the sense of family members and her daughter, and then right. launching her you went in and got your degree and went into a position where you serve more. Uh, you yeah, she's been doing this. that for like 22 years. Yeah. Is what and, my so note she, says. Yeah. and so, so. <laughs> you went to the agency on aging and there are a little bit different names from state to state. So this is normally we talk about caregiver journey and we lean it into just the direct, but this is such an important group from state to state um, that I wanted to make sure that we touched on the agency on aging and, and kind of, you mentioned the word ombudsman. Number one, it's hard to spell. Okay. So if it's you, not hard I, to say sometimes it's a little, and it's a funny word. It's like puppy. I love that word, but um, just because it's the piece, but I like certain words, <laughs> Janet, <laughs> like they're Sorry, fun to Janet. say bulb. And so <laughs> that's a fun one. <laughs> and so you're welcome. Yeah, this is why my mom sent me off to college with JJ. Yeah. <laughs> so JJ, get her out of the house. Get her out of the house. She's driving me crazy. So, like, talk to me about 
like you decided I want to go to the agency on aging where I can serve more, but let's talk a little bit what that is and how that supports individuals, um, the aging population um, specifically, but what are some of those things? And, and maybe Jay, you have a different question, but just, yeah, but she's, she, I know there are a lot of resources, Janet, and that's a big thing that we have taken from you yeah. and stolen that actually help caregivers as we, they work with their own aging uh, parents or uh, people that they care for. So tell us a little bit about the agency. So if, if we speak more in generic terms, a local area agency on aging provides services and supports to older adults and their caregivers. Mm -hmm. And in, in some, some situations, we provide um, services to adults with disabilities. Okay. And that may, may mean just, it may mean consultation. It may mean things like options counseling. So, you know, we we provide support so that persons can remain independent, you know, maximize their independence and provide supports to the caregivers, but also helping them through the processes of accessing uh, long-term services and supports or any community-based supports that would be helpful in their caregiver role. And, uh, you know, the, the common statement among the area agencies on aging is when you see one area agency on aging, you've seen one area agency on aging. Yeah. They're, they're different. Um, they may have some of the similar core services, but they may be different in, in additional supports that they offer. And, and I'll be honest with you, I, I didn't in, you know, when I graduated from college, mm -hmm. I didn't go looking for the area agency on aging. I was, I, I was, came, I came out of college and did a job with one of our local, um, it was the internet provider. And it, at that time, there's a lot of turmoil with that particular entity, but I had the counseling background and the counseling skills to be able to talk to people on the phone. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, I happened to see, uh, uh, I, I happened to see that that wasn't me. Yeah. I wasn't cut out for that because when I stand up from my desk, when I'm talking to somebody, you know, it's, it's, it's a moment that we need to have a really a good conversation with each other. Mm -hmm. So I actually received a phone call um, and at that time, the ombudsman program was going through another area agency on the aging, the funding and everything. And um, her name was Norma. And Norma said, "Are you know, I want to talk to you about this job and uh, of your interest in the job. I never submitted an application or a resume. And I, I'm not sure how it got to her. And to Ooh. this day, I still don't know. But she interviewed divine me on intervention. The, it was divine intervention. And she mentioned what the job was. I did some research. She said, would you like to interview? And I said, I would love to. Yeah. So I interviewed for the, uh, I did, it was a panel interview. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'm coming out of that first interview, like, oh my gosh, I don't have a snowball's chance. <laughs> <laughs> I am not remotely qualified. I do that for every job I apply for. You know, I, and it was just, just, just my doubt that I could, I could do to, to the level. And then I, I did even more research, found out what the job was. And I said, this is everything I've ever known, everything I've ever done, everything that I've ever come to be in my role as a caregiver, in my role as a, as, as, as a mom, in my role as a family member, caring for, you know, our parents um, when, when I was younger. And so I said, well, whatever is going to be, is going to be. Yeah. So they called me for a second interview and I go, yes. <laughs> so during the question, and it was a panel interview, you know, several people. And I remember at one point the question was, and I love the lady, I loved her dearly. She was the executive director of uh, the other area agency on aging. And she said, well, you haven't had experience working with the aging population. What makes you think you're qualified? And I'm paraphrasing, please know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What makes you think you're qualified for the job? And I thought, okay, this is the third interview and I have, I have to be strong. And I looked at her and I said, with all due respect, I said, 
during the course of this inter these interviews, you've talked about advocacy, you've talked about empowerment, you've talked about providing support and working to resolve conflicts. I said, to be honest with you, I've got the education to back up my experience. I've got the experience to back up my education. I'm the best one for the job. Oh, that's a mic drop. And for me to do that was like, oh, Oh crap, I said that out loud. Do you think they'll buy it? It, it wasn't in my head anymore. So um and and I'm I'm privileged and fortunate to have been given that opportunity. So I, it, the interview was in Roanoke and I lived about an hour and 15 minutes away and within by the in the course of me driving back, they had already called to my home and offered me the job. Yeah. Heck yeah. But I was on my way to vacation, so oh. I'm delayed in getting back to them. But I will say to you, and in, sweat. at that moment and in all these years, I feel privileged to be able to be in this role, to offer support to caregivers, but to let caregivers know they don't have to do this alone. And when I speak to caregivers, you know, sometimes persons will say, you may not understand, or you may not know what I'm talking about. And I can honestly sit with a great deal of empathy because I've traveled a similar road, not their road, not their journey, but to say to them, you don't have to do this alone. You have the support. And I offer resources, offer information. And that's what our agency on aging does. We offer that information. We offer that support um, so they don't have to walk the journey alone. Mm. You know, it, it feels so good. Jay, I think you were going to ask something. I was just, well, uh, I was just, that was like a warm hug. I know. Well, I know that, um, Janet, we're going to definitely, uh, include, uh, the New River Valley, your contact information yeah. in our show notes, because I know we'll have a lot of listeners that are like, oh, wait a minute. She talked about all kinds of resources or ways that people yeah. can get support. And I want people to know that uh, we'll include those in the show notes for sure, Nat, um, to make sure that they'll know how to get Janet you know, uh, and the agency. Yeah, and I think this was just, uh, you know, and, and, and we're just, you know, as we kind of come to a close, just thinking about um, how it was so, what your statement around just like, you thought about your caregiving journey with your parents, you thought about it with your daughter, you thought, you know what I mean? Like, it, and, and the fact that you didn't apply for the job, that's, that is, you have been a blessing to so many people. And I think that the blessings came back to you. And, and I do. And when I say to persons today is a blessing because we've been given one more day to find moments of joy. And something as simple when you can sit with a family in a nursing home and they know that their loved one's life is passing and you can sit there and say, let's be joyful of, of the memories of the experiences that your loved one brought into your life. They can still hear you. And I did that Friday night. And the lady hadn't been responsive for a couple of days, but Friday night when I showed them how to still communicate their love as, as caregivers for her and as family members. And then she, the, the lady started tearing and she, you tears were coming down the side of her face. It gave them joy. Mm -hmm. And, um, I feel privileged and, and, and I will say if I must, if I may do this, we we can't do the work that we do without our community partners, with those who are in the community, like you, JJ, and you, Natalie, that we come together in 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 coordination with each other. And it's sort of like running that 600 relay that where one, one stops, you know, one finishes their leg of, of that relay, mm -hmm. but at one given moment, you see them running together. So they pass the baton off to each other mm -hmm. and then one slows down and then the other one takes off running. If you watch those relays and that's pretty much what this is. Let us be there with you. Let us help you. We'll do what needs to be done, but help you be strong and help you 
have those resources and that connection with other entities. Mm -hmm. And then you can take off on your own. Mm -hmm. I think that's called caring forward, Natalie. I think that sounds like caring forward. Because <laughs> that's what we do. I think we care we forward. We well, do. Janet, thank you so much for being here with us again and continuing our <laughs> conversation because it's you've lived such a full life. And continue. And to continue, bless continue us all. to bless and care forward. Yeah. Like, I, I hope I hope that is true. And I'm very humble. And my personality actually, believe it or not, is as an introvert. And it's, it, you know, I have those moments and I'm I'm working on being more, you know, a little bit out. I, what can I say? A little bit more extrovert, but that's not my nature, not my personality. But I will say to you that after the death of my husband, after the death of my daughter, I had to figure out things and figure out life and figure out about continuing a life well lived. Mm. And I will say to you, I have that. Mm. And to come, come out of the role of personal caregiving, but to be supportive of other caregivers, my life is well lived. And if tomorrow or today I get notification that today's my last day, I will say no regrets. I've learned along the way. I hope that I've touched lives so that they know there are persons like the two of you, like you, JJ, and you, Natalie, that helps other people hear those stories, hear our stories, but to know they can do it. Yeah. Mm. They can they can serve and they can survive and still find a quality of life after that caregiving role stops. Mm. Janet, we love you. I, know. I love you so guys. Much. I love I you love girls you. too. Thank ah! you so much. And we look forward to seeing you uh, soon. I hope our paths cross again, at least the next time I'm in Roanoke. Oh, <laughs> so, Janet and I are already besties. We've yeah, been, we've been yeah. eating um, dark chocolates together. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> Janet, thank you so much. We love you. You're we hope so all welcome. of our listeners have been uh, blessed, and uh, we uh, we thank you, Janet. And until next time, everybody, yep. uh, when we confess again, thanks so much. Yep.